Welcome to Plan ORE. This is the second part of the medical emergency asthma. And we would be discussing your some unseen rare questions of asthmatic attack. In the part one, we have discussed what exactly is asthma, how it's asked in different ways by the examiner. What is the management? What are the three situations following the management? Some things about the drug salbutamol, like the advantages, disadvantages, the mechanism of action, and a few things about the volume spacer device. In this part, we would study about the demonstration of the salbutamol inhaler, and a few more things about the spacer devices the definition and the pathophysiology of asthma and a quick recap of both the parts and the end so stay tuned for part two and if you like us give us a like subscribe to us and contact us in an, any of the following the site phone number mail id or the fp or the whatsapp group so let's begin with the demonstration of the equipment when they ask you to do so, you need to lift the salbutamol inhaler from the table which is in front of you. You need to identify it. It probably may be inside a box. So you need to, but it will be written a salbutamol inhaler and there would be a diagram on the box. So it's very easy to identify. Just lift the box and remove the inhaler from inside. And it looks something like this. So you will pick it up, you will say this is a salbutamol inhaler, I will check the name, dose, batch number and the expiry date. This thing is common for all the medications whether you mention it while giving answers or while demonstrating the equipment. Then you will say that I'll shake it well. You can do that as well to the inhaler and I'll remove the cap as it's shown in the figure. I will then prime it in air. Prime it in air means you will actually be spraying some amount of the medicine in the air by pressing it gently on the top. And when you do that, when you apply pressure on the top, some amount of medicine will come out in the air. I would advise you not to do it, but just mention the thing to the examiner because it's not good to actually spray the medication in the air when you're actually not going to use it. However, if the examiner tells you that I want to see how you do it, then probably you can press the button. You will then tell that I'll check for any uh, foreign objects inside the inhaler because there is a chance that within this small cap over here, there is a small thing stuck inside. So you have to take it out. So you just say, I will take it out, take out any foreign objects if there are any. And the next thing I'll do is I'll attach it to a volume spacer device. Now you will be having this volume spacer device present on the table. So lift it up. It is in two parts. As you can see, it is, this one is part one and this one is a part two. You just need to attach both of them and make a funnel kind of a thing. Now it has a big end like you can see in the figure which is protruded out and one at the other end there is a small hole which is flat. So the protruded end goes inside the patient's mouth and the flat end is the hole in the flat end you need to attach the inhaler over there. It's quite simple. So just attach the funnel and make sure that you attach the uh, inhaler at the flat end where there is a hole. Then you will tell the examiner that once I have attached it to the large volume spacer device, I would then tell the patient to exhale completely. Now all this just needs to be told to the examiner because there is no patient who is going to be there, nor you need to do it on the mannequin. So you will just tell this that I'll tell the patient to exhale completely so that all the air comes out of his lungs. I will then attach the volume spacer to his mouth. I'll tell the patient to close the mouth around it and I'll give one puff. 
I'll tell the patient to inhale and hold for as long as possible and then exhale. It's quite simple if you just try to understand it. First, the patient exhales out any air so that his lungs, lungs are empty. You then put the volume spacer device inside and press the inhaler from here so that all the medication goes inside and then you tell the patient to inhale so all the medication actually goes inside and you tell him to hold as long as he can hold his breath when he does that the medication tends to remain inside his lungs and doesn't come out and then you can remove the spacer device and the patient can exhale again you again repeat it you re-administer re after 30 to sec 30 60 seconds a second puff now in some notes if you will see it is written as 60 seconds whereas some faculty members say it to be 30 seconds so the better way to say is is somewhere around 30 to 30, 60 seconds or you can just mention 60 seconds and again you will place the volume spacer device Tell the patient to exhale first, then place a volume spacer device, press the inhaler and then tell the patient to inhale whatever medication has come in the spacer device which will go inside. So if you remember, you can give approximately 10 puffs at a time and then wait and watch if the patient is getting any better, like we learned in the management section in the part 1. So it's quite easy. You lift the salbutamol inhaler, check the name dose patch number expiry date, shake it well, remove the cap, prime it in air, check for any foreign objects, attach it to the spacer device and then give him one puff. Once you have done that, after some time of about 60 seconds, you administer a second puff. Now, the second question they can ask you is that there is something special about an asthmatic patient regarding the ibuprofen. So, if the patient has any kind of dental pain, you wouldn't prescribe him ibuprofen or aspirin, naproxen, diclofenax and so on. And why is that? Because we all know that these medications are responsible to trigger asthmatic attacks. So, they are a complete no-no or contraindicated in asthmatic patients. And which medication do you think you will give for pain? And that best one would be paracetamol because it's the safest drug. Now there is a small addition which is a very rare question which they may ask that what actually is present in these medications that result in an asthmatic attack? And if they ask you so, they, you can say that these medications result in overproduction of some leukotrienes and these leukotrienes are responsible for actually causing allergy because you know that asthma is actually caused by the production of histamines and prostaglandins and leukotrienes and salbutamol inhibits them as we studied in the mechanism of action so these aspirins and anisades will also produce the same leukotrienes and histamines and will produce an asthmatic attack so to prevent that you will always prescribe paracetamol to that patient. You need to remember this in the medical link of a DTP in case you're asked or in case your patient has an asthmatic attack, you remember that you need to prescribe paracetamol and not ibuprofen. There are a few more questions which have not yet been asked or have been asked very rarely is about the different volume spacer devices or you also call them as aero chambers so they come in three different colors orange which is a small for zero to one years yellow medium one to five years and the large one is blue which is about for adults or more than five years these if are present you can easily identify them with the color the next question is what other acute medical condition can mimic an asthmatic attack and that is your anaphylaxis. If you remember an asthmatic attack if deteriorates can result in life threatening asthma which is very similar to anaphylaxis. So it is really very difficult to distinguish between the two 
and that is why for this answer this question when they say mimic the best answer is anaphylaxis they may ask you the definition of asthma and the pathophysiology of asthma which is very rare and haven't ever been asked but it's good to know them it's there in your notes so the best thing is to make an attempt to remember the definition and if not at least try to understand what it is it's a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways and uh, it occurs in some susceptible individuals inflammatory symptoms are usually associated with widespread but variable airflow obstruction and an increase in an airway response to a variety of stimuli now definitions are something and classifications are something which you actually have to remember it by heart and I, I understand that it's the most boring and the most difficult thing to do so just try to make a sense of what it is and I'm sure you will understand because this is very similar to what you, what you know you know that asthma happens only in certain individuals who are susceptible they produce inflammatory symptoms and they cause airflow obstruction and they happen because of any kind of stimuli like any allergies or dust allergy or any other allergens which can result in asthma. So just try to memorize it in an order and learn it. The next thing is the pathophysiology of the asthma. Again, as you can see, it's a flow chart and those are things which happen one after the other. So the best thing is to remember them in an order. So there are certain factors which cause this problem. This results in bronchospasm and bronchoconstriction. They then lead to bronchial edema. Because there is a blockage, it will result in a swelling. That's the edema. And when there is a swelling, the mucus will start increasing and will actually form a plug. And when it, is, it forms a plug, it is very difficult for the air to pass through. And this will result in difficulty in exhaling. So the patient won't be able to exhale his air out from the lungs. And because of this, uh, there won't be any proper exchange in the body. And this will result in a decreased oxygen supply in the brain, which will result in hypo hypoxia. And it will result in increase in carbon dioxide that's hypercapnia because the patient is not able to have a proper exhalation so the carbon dioxide is building up inside his body and finally the patient will there will be dehydration because of the increased respiratory water loss so this too is quite simple just follow the order because of the factors there is bronchospasm bronchoconstriction resulting in swelling resulting in mucus production which blocks the airways preventing any exhalation decreasing the oxygen and increasing the carbon dioxide resulting in dehydration you don't need to remember this word to word so just understand the process this is an important thing where they may ask you the difference in the dosages of the child and everything is similar except the maximum number of times you can administer the puff so whether a child has an asthma or an adult has, you will always administer 10 puffs at a time. But if you remember in management, we studied that if the patient does not get better and the symptoms remain the same, you can re-administer salbutamol, a set of 10 puffs again. So till what point of time can you keep doing that? In an adult, you can do it for approximately 5 times, that's 50 puffs. But in a child, you can administer the maximum is two and a half times, that's 25 puffs. So that is the only thing which is the difference between an adult and a child. So remember to hear or listen to the age in the uh, when the examiner is telling you the medical emergency scenario. Now, we know that we use a salbutamol inhaler up to 10 puffs but you may come across four to six puffs in some other places so don't get confused and I'm, i have just put it down so that you remember where it's four to six puffs and where it is ten puffs so in an asthmatic attack it's always ten puffs remember that and that's according to the rcs guidelines so you don't need to worry about the rhesus guidelines 
when the patient has an anaphylactic attack at that time too after giving adrenaline sometimes you give him a salbutamol inhaler to help him breathing at that point of time you give him four to six puffs and the second emergency is when the patient has aspirated a small foreign object like a tooth or an amalgam filling or a file but it is aspirated it has gone inside and the patient is feeling unwell because of the foreign object inside his chest and he is finding it difficult to breathe at that point too you will give him a salbutamol inhaler again four to six puffs so when it's a choking aspiration scenario or an anaphylactic scenario it's four to six puffs when it's an asthmatic attack it's ten puffs don't worry we will revise them again while we'll do those medical emergencies so in a quick recap we did the different scenarios it can be asked in what to listen to when the examiner is talking diagnosis management the three situations following the management the high risk patients salbutamol and the questions on it like what it is mechanism of action disadvantages and the administration different doses of salbutamol inhaler and the spacer devices and some more unseen rare questions like the definition and the pathophysiology of asthma so with that we come to an end of the asthma medical emergency and if you like us please come and join us at planuari we will offer and cover everything online at the comfort of your home there are a lot of more free videos which are present on the youtube so you can always go and have a look at it and if you want to come and join us through the website phone number or the mail id all the links are given in the description below thank you so much bye bye